Good morning, everyone. Welcome to College Talks from um, KnowledgeWorks. And I'm going to wait until I've got everybody signing on. I see everybody coming in and signing on here. All right, I hope you're all doing well today. I know I've got some people um, on the West Coast and some people signing in from the East Coast. And um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, just give a little background as to uh, what prompted putting together this college talk. So I was in the process of putting together a um, college fair and then the lovely COVID-19 hit us all and that got canceled. Um, not only for myself, but for all college fairs across the country. So I reached out to various college reps um, with, you know, through the various organizations that I'm in. And um, they were so gracious and wonderful to um, agree to participate in the, this series that I'm launching today with these first three schools. Uh, Miami University of Ohio, University of Oregon, and Tulane, <laughs> and their reps, and um, they have been wonderful in agreeing to present to us. So without further ado, I am going to go ahead and I am going to um, give you uh, the bios on each of our presenters for today. So first presenting will be uh, Miami University of Ohio. And that is Larissa Marple. And um, she's a graduate of um, Texas Christian University, where she received her bachelor's in political science and fashion merchandising, and then went on to go get her um, master's degree from the University of Southern Carolina in um, higher education and student affairs. And she is the assistant director of regional enrollment. Um, so she is here on the West Coast. Uh, and she is, um, let's see, she's currently in Seattle, um, here on the West Coast, and um, her focus is um, on st student conduct and context of um, higher education. Um, and then next presenting, we have Loretta Klosterman, and she is um, the Northern California Admissions Counselor for the University of Oregon. She is originally from the San Luis Obispo County area, and uh, she attended the University of Redlands in Southern California and has been in, in the admissions world for um, five years. And uh, although she is uh, living in Northern California, she is a, a native of, of this area and she's been working in the admissions for out-of-state schools for the past five years. So she's an expert with regards to how California students um, and that, what that world looks like um, for California students with out-of-state schools. And she's actually a WUI expert too. So I had her present for me before on WUI. And so if you have any WUI questions, ask her. Um, and then last but not least, we have Jeff Schiffman from Tulane and he is the director of admissions at Tulane um, in New Orleans. And um, he manages um, the global recruitment and presence strategy for the entire university. He's very busy. If you've been on his blog and you watch his um, day in the life of Jeff, he's up at like the crack of dawn um, and then goes until very late in the evening. So he's got a great blog page also. He also works with um, his um, student tour guides. And so he's very familiar with all aspects of Tulane, obviously being the director of admissions. So those are our three presenters today with those three schools. I'm gonna hand it over to Larissa. We are gonna go off screen. That way only Larissa will be the only one there. And if you have any questions, post them into the Q&A and I will be um, moderating that. And then as the questions come through, we will put all the Q&A at the end of the presentation. And if you have any questions, we will answer them for you then. All right, so here we go. Awesome. Hey everyone, my name is Larissa Marple. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. I work for Miami University and we are located in Oxford, Ohio, which is close to Cincinnati, Ohio, kind of in the Southwest corner. We were established in 1809, which actually makes us the 10th oldest public institution in the United States, which is kind of a fun fact. Um, and unfortunately, of course, you aren't physically on campus right now, but it's an older campus with huge trees, beautiful red brick buildings. Um, 
and hopefully I'll send um, some information maybe later. We have some virtual tours so you can see it. But I want to talk to you a little bit about kind of in, what we look for in students and the types of students that come to us. So um, you can see some of our just statistics here and I'll talk through some of these. So we have over 120 majors. We are a public institution and um, we have about 17,000 undergraduate students, but we say that we have the brains of a big university, but the heart of a small school. And that's because our student to faculty ratio is only 17 to one, and we only have about 30 students average in each class. So although we are medium to larger size, you don't really feel like that when you're on campus. We really try to have hands-on learning. Um, we have over 600 student organizations. I always say that our students are very, very involved involved in the classroom, obviously, but they're very involved outside the classroom as well. And we have a really strong school spirit. And because we're kind of in a rural college town, the students are really, really engaged and engrossed in the Miami University experience and in the city of Oxford, and um, which just makes for a really unique experience. Um, you can see at the bottom there that we're ranked number three in the nation for undergraduate teaching. And basically what that means is that our professors actually teach our classes. So we don't have teaching assistants or graduate students that are teaching courses. They are all taught by the professors. We're not a tier one public research institution because our professor's primary goal is teaching first and research second, and they support student research um, as opposed to being focused on their own. They do research, but that's not their primary focus. So just something interesting. Um, a lot of students don't really think about who's going to be teaching their classes when they're in their college search, um, but for us, it's gonna be the professors, which is really great. It's very engaging. Aging, they help you get jobs. Um, they're also your faculty advisors, so you get really great one-on-one um, -on -one connections with them. And then this just shows again undergraduate teaching. So we were one of what's called the original public Ivy universities, and these were institutions that were denoted as having um, similar to Ivy League level education, but at a public school price. So obviously it's a little bit different than going to an Ivy League school, but the education you're going to get, we truly believe is worthy um, of an Ivy League education, but of course without paying that sticker price. You'll see here some of our um, just averages for accepted students. Keep in mind, this data is a little bit outdated. Typically, we would have our new data from the students who would be entering for fall 2020, however, and we extend our deadline due to COVID-19 to June 1st, so we don't have any updated information yet. But from what our director has told me, I reached out to her, this has pretty much stayed the same. So you can see where our middle GPA, ACT, SAT, et cetera are. For GPA, we do use weighted, so um, just keep that in mind. But we do a holistic review. So while you can see here where your scores might fall and if your GPA is somewhere uh, within our range, keep in mind, we look at everything. So we have students that fall well below and above all of these ranges and we look at your entire application. We are on the Common App and we do require one letter of recommendation from a counselor or um, teacher, someone of that nature. But for the most part, our application is relatively straightforward. Um, even though we're a public institution, you can see that only about 43% of our students are actually from Ohio. The next largest portion is out of state domestic students, and then we have about 11% international students as well. So you can just kind of see the breakdown there. Um, I know this is probably a question that's going to come up, so I'll address it now. We don't know yet if we're going test optional for next year. Um, I was actually just asked to be on a working group to help make that decision for our institution um, to see if we're going to go test optional due to COVID-19. If so, what that looks like. Are we going to do it for one year? Are we going to um, expand that and always be test optional? So right now, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I will definitely keep you all posted and we will make sure our website and everything is updated um, as those decisions are made. And then my favorite thing to talk about with my out-of-state students is our merit scholarships. So if you look on the left, you can see test scores. And then you can see high school GPA on a four-point scale. And we do adjust this, of course, if your high school has a 5.0 scale or 100-point scale, something in that nature. But if you have a minimum of a 26 on your ACT or 1230 SAT and a 3.5 weighted GPA, for out-of-state students, you'll get at least $7,000 a year annually in merit scholarship all the way up to half or full tuition, depending on your test scores. Now again, 
if we go test optional, we're not exactly sure what this is going to look like. And that's one of our big discussion points. But just keep in mind, if you've taken the pre-SAT or anything of that nature, you might know where your range is. Um, you might be able to tell if you're going to get some merit scholarship, which can really help offset that cost. Um, our tuition right now is about $35,000 for out of state and about 15,000 room and board. So sticker price is just under 50,000, but a majority of our out of state students are paying a little bit less than that due to merit scholarship. We also have what we call our four year guaranteed tuition promise. So this is, um, this means that when you start at Miami University as a first year student, your tuition is going to stay the same. That includes room and board, it includes fees, tuition, et cetera. So you can see here, um, everything that means in your scholarships retain their full value for four years. Now, if you end up taking longer, that can change, but a majority of our students graduate in four years and they're able to keep the cost the same. So you don't have to estimate how much you're going to be paying every year. And this is, can be really helpful. Um, our parents really appreciate this. You can actually plan how much it's going to cost um, for all four years that you're there. And then lastly, these are just some fun statistics and rankings and things of that nature about graduation and success. So we care about you while you're at Miami University, but we also want you to be successful. So you can see here, 96% of our graduating students from 2017, 2018 were either employed or furthering their education within six months of graduating. Um, and we're really proud of that statistic, especially being a public institution. And we actually had 74% of our graduates complete that survey. So we feel very confident that that data is accurate. Um, and we really feel strongly that if you are really committed to graduating from Miami University and you're looking for a job, then we are going to help you and get you placed. You can also see 98% law school acceptance and 79% medical school acceptance, which are both well above the national average. So hope you learned a little bit. I'm looking forward to your questions. I'm going to pass it off to Loretta to talk a little bit about the University of Oregon. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, once again, my name is Loretta Klosterman and I am the Regional Admissions Counselor for the University of Oregon based in Northern California, but do work with students in the Central Coast. So really excited to be able to work with my hometown and my home area. Um, but with the University of Oregon, we are located in the city of Eugene. And as you can see on the map, um, we are like right in the heart of the Willamette Valley. So we're about two Two hours south of Portland and about three and a half hours away from the California border. So really easy for us Californians to get to Eugene. Eugene even has its own airport and San Francisco has direct flights into Eugene as well. But just like anywhere in the Pacific Northwest, we are an incredible area for outdoor recreation. So within minutes of the university, our students have access to hundreds of miles of hiking trails, biking trails, even water sports, because we are home to the McKinsey and the Willamette Rivers. Um, but we are equidistant from the Cascade Mountains as well as the Oregon coastline. So our students take full advantage of going snowboarding and skiing in the winter, even going out for a trip to the coast. And some of our students are brave enough to go into the Oregon waters, but it's a little chilly for my taste. But our campus itself is an incredible 300 acre campus. You can see it is pretty much green year round, and that is because in Oregon, it rains a lot more here than California. I definitely get a lot of questions about the weather. It is nothing to be intimidated about um, because the activity of campus and the liveliness of the university does not change rain or shine. The biggest recommendation I can give to you is to invest in waterproof gear and not water resistant. There is a huge difference and growing up in an area like the Central Coast where it is 75 degrees year round, that definitely is a little bit of a learning experience. But as long as you get that waterproof gear, you you'll be totally fine. But uh, Eugene and, uh, or I should say the University of Oregon, 
um, is a mid-sized campus. So we have a total population of about 23,000. However, our undergraduate population is 19,000. So we really do focus on that undergraduate education. So as I start sharing a little bit more with you about um, the opportunities our students do have, it's truly there for you as an undergraduate student to take advantage of. We have over 200 different academic programs. Some of the programs that we are most known for is architecture, business, environmental science and studies, marine biology, education, psychology, just to name a few, but we do offer a lot. Something that I do like to highlight when talking about our academic majors is that you are not required to declare your major when you apply to the University of Oregon. We understand that when you get to college, you're going to be exposed to a lot of different academic programs than you are in high school. So we built our education so students have the opportunity to explore and figure out what you're passionate about before you declare that major. And about one third of our students do start at the University of Oregon as exploring. So your uh, application and admission will not be negatively impacted if you click undecided on the application. In relation to academics, um, we are also home to the Clark Honors College. And the Clark Honors College is the second oldest honors college um, west of the Mississippi and really designed for students to have a more rigorous academic experience. Kind of think of an extension of IB, AP, or even honors coursework when you're in college. Students not only do have to apply for general admission into the University of Oregon, but they'll also submit a supplemental application to the Clark Honors College. And as a Clark Honors College student, one third of your classes will be taken through the Clark Honors College. These are your general education classes. That means your classes for your major, your minor, or even electives are taken with the rest of the student population. So it's a very inclusive environment. Class sizes through CHC are capped at 25 and on average are only about 19 students. So it's a very small academic environment. And to formally graduate from the Clark Honors College, students do have to complete a master's level thesis, which is something that may sound intimidating in this moment in time, but trust me, you will have the full support and guidance with your um, academic advisor and your faculty advisor to really create this incredible master's level thesis while an undergraduate student. The U of O is also a member of uh, the AAU, which is the Association of American Universities. We're one out of about 64, 65 institutions to be a member of the AAU, and we're being recognized for academic excellence and the overall opportunities our students do have while attending the University of Oregon. We're in great accompaniment with schools like Berkeley and Davis, but also Harvard and Yale. So we do take a very strong sense of pride that we have been invited to be a part of such a prestigious organization. Kind of in relation to being an AAU member, we are a tier one research institution. So the same caliber as research as our UCs here. And research on campus spans across all of our disciplines. Some examples is our physics students was part of the research team that helped discover water on Mars. We have our own research facility on the coast of Oregon just for our marine biology students. And 90% of the public K through 12 schools in the state of Oregon implement research that has been done at our College of education. So matter, no matter what you study at the U of O, you will have that opportunity to research and that field work experience. We also want to make sure our students have that opportunity to get outside of Oregon and even Eugene to enhance their education. And study abroad will look differently in the coming years, but I always like to highlight that we definitely encourage our students to have that global education. And so we do offer very traditional study abroad programs, but some pretty unique experiences, including international internships, as well as a pre-freshman study abroad experience where you can theoretically study abroad with us before you even move into your residential halls. And it would be a complete crime if I did not talk about the spirit and energy in campus life at the U of O. You'll find that our faculty, our staff, our alumni, our students are so enthused to be um, a member of the Duck family. And with over 300 clubs and organizations, you'll find that our students are very connected and invested within our campus life and our campus culture. We are Division I athletics. We are definitely known for our football team, basketball team, especially 
especially our women's team. They've been on fire these last few years, but we are most famously known for track and field. So Eugene's nickname is actually Track Town USA, and we are the birthplace of a company you may have heard of called Nike. But Eugene will be hosting the World Championships for track and field, as well as the Olympic trials for track and field in the coming years. So we're really excited to have these very global events come to our campus. Part of that, establishing that strong sense of community, of course, is living on campus. We do require all of our first year students to live, um, to really establish that sense of community and find your place at the U of O. Uh, our students have the option to live in an academic residential community, also known as an ARC. These are themed living learning environments. Being that it does have an academic component, every ARC does have a faculty advisor and one class that is associated with the theme of your ARC. This allows students to live with others who are like-minded and also have similar passions. Now switching gears to our application and admissions process, um, we are on the common application. We're also on the coalition application and have our own application on our website. We have no preference how you apply to the U of O. We just really want you to apply. Here you'll see our class profile. Similar to Larissa, this information is for last year's class um, because we have extended our deadlines. Um, we don't have updated information, but um, our middle 50% averages really haven't changed much this year. But you'll see this is kind of a ballpark for our students. Some students fall above this range, some students fall below, but it gives you a nice idea of where you can fall to be competitive for admission. Now, the University of Oregon is test optional for fall 2020 moving forward, or fall 2021 moving forward. This was a decision that already had been made, um, so we were prepared to, you know, announce this publicly this spring, and it just kind of came at a time where a lot of schools are also going test optional. So being test optional for the U of O means that we no longer require SAT or ACT test scores to be eligible for admission. However, if you do decide to submit test scores, we also super score. So let's say you took the SAT multiple times, we'll take your highest score in each subcategory and combine that and create your overall highest score. But we conduct a holistic review process at the U of O. So yes, your GPA and your test scores are important, but we are going to consider the other factors on this slide for admission. So we do require a personal statement and an extracurricular activities list. We want to get to know you and how you're involved in your community and how that might be reflected in, into our community at the University of Oregon. Letters of recommendation are optional, and I truly mean optional. We would never fault a student for not submitting letters of recommendation. However, if you're hovering at about like a 3.0 GPA, I definitely encourage it. It's strongly recommended and no more than two letters of recommendation, but make sure one of those is academics so written by a teacher or a counselor. So these are some deadlines to be aware of. Um, with November 1, that is our early action deadline. If you apply by November 1, you'll hear an admissions notification no later than December 15th. And then the regular decision deadline is January 15th. Our admissions rates do not differ between either deadline. So it's really um, how prepared you are to submit your application and when that may be. If you're somebody who needs a little extra time to write that personal statement or want that first semester of senior year grades on your transcript, that's why we have January 15th. So um, just know that either way, you still have the same opportunity for admission. And lastly, I'll cover a little bit about scholarships as well as um, financial aid and tuition. Very similar to um, the University of Miami, um, we are also guaranteed tuition. So this means that um, you will pay the same rate for tuition your freshman year all through your senior year. This is guaranteed for five years, and that is because our architecture programs are five-year long programs due to their accreditation. So we wanna make sure all of our students have that opportunity for guaranteed tuition. These are our merit scholarships. Students um, do have to meet the GPA and test score requirement to have to in order to have these merit scholarships awarded. The Summit, UO Excellence, and APEX are automatic consideration based on your GPA and test scores. Stamps and Diversity Excellence do require a separate application. Now we have not made a decision whether um, test scores will play a factor into merit scholarships being awarded for the next fall. So this is something to just check back in with the U of O or even with me directly later this summer and I'll be happy to update you. But thank you all for taking the time to learn a little bit more about the U of O. I'm gonna pass the baton to Jeff. 
Awesome. Well, thank you all very much for having me here. My name is Jeff and I'm the Director of Undergraduate Admission at Tulane University. We are located right in the heart of New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, a little bit about myself, I actually graduated from Tulane. I graduated from Tulane with the class of 2005 and I uh, had a double major in marketing and management. And um, on the next slide, you can actually see a little bit about my minor. Uh, I was a minor in glass blowing. That's not me in the photo, uh, but we, fun fact, have the largest glass blowing studio on any college campus in America. And I was kind of adventurous in college and I was like, all right, that sounds cool. I'll be a glass blowing minor. So I was. Um, thinking a little bit about the university, there's kind of three main points that I want to uh, express to y'all today about what I think um, could put you in on your list. One of the things I talk a lot about when I talk with prospective students uh, and I think my colleagues did, did a great job of addressing this as well. Each of our schools has some really, really strong attributes. And so at this point in the college application process, the big question should not be what's the best university out there, but the question should be what's the best university for me. Um, I'm a strong believer that there's no bad universities in America, there are only bad fits. And so I think now is a really good time to start kind of thinking about where you think you're going to fit in really well. And so there's three things about Tulane that I think make us a really good fit. And those are the three things that I want to speak with you all about. First is our size. Um, the second is the type of people that go to school here. And the third is our location. You'll see on this slide a little bit about our size. Um, we're actually a little bit bigger than that. That's last year's numbers. We're about 7,500 students right now. But I think first and foremost, asking yourself how big of a school do you want to go to is a really good way of kind of figuring out where you're going to fit in in terms of size. And so for me, I love Tulane because I think we are the ultimate medium-sized university. We give you all the benefits of a big school and all the benefits of a small school combined into one. So we are big enough that um, we have all the benefits of a big university. We are a division one school. We are a tier one research university. You've heard a little bit about the American Association of Universities. We are in that as well. Basically, that means that we've got a med school, a law school, all the benefits you want from a big university. But the undergraduate population, as I mentioned, is just over 7,000 undergraduate students. So what you're really going to find at Tulane is that you'll get the best of both worlds. Um, I was on a first name basis with almost every single professor that I had at Tulane. Uh, we're a division one school, but every single student gets free seasons tickets to all the athletic events that we play in. So one of the things I love is that we've got the benefits of a big research university, but you can actually do anything you want. Um, one of the things I love about Tulane is our flexibility. If you apply to Tulane and you're admitted to our university, you're automatically admitted into all of our schools and all of our colleges with no separate application required. So what that means is we've got about 80 majors to choose from and sometime in your first two years, you just pick your major and you're automatically in that program. So what this means is you don't have to apply to be pre-med, you're not applying to be in our business school. We truly have the flexibility of a small liberal arts college where you just pick whatever major you want and that's the program that you're in. So if you kind of answer that question of how big of a school do you want to go to, that's a good way to get a sense of if a school is going to be a good fit for you. And I think we're a nice medium sized experience between the two. I'll give you a final example. Um, uh, a lot of times all of us admission reps start to sound the same. And one of the things we always say is that if you want to start your own club or organization, you know, you just get 10 signatures and you can make it happen. Uh, and we do that at the same thing at Tulane, but we do it a little bit differently. Um, if you want to start your own organization at Tulane, I think if you go to the next slide, there might be some photos of this. Um, if you want to start your own organization at Tulane, we make it really easy to do so because you simply just approach your peers and um, you actually approach your peers in our student government association and you say, hey, here's the club I want to get started and your peers in student government get to give you a specific amount of money to get it started. Uh, in fact, last year, the Princeton Review uh, ranked our student government as the top 10 most active in the country. And it's in large part because they're in charge of almost $5 million of our university's budget. So they get to decide where these organizations get started. Uh, you'll see one of them in the, in the photo right there is Crawfest. It's the largest student-run music festival on any college campus in America and takes place at Tulane every year. But my favorite organization, four years ago, one of my favorite students here at Tulane was a kid by the name of Adam Klein. And when Adam was a freshman at Tulane, he decided that he wanted to bring a service puppy onto our campus. And he wanted to, to train this puppy to eventually it would go on to be a, an adult service dog and he would give it to a family with disabilities. So he approached our student government and they were like, I don't know about a dog living in the dorms and walking around the library, but they gave him the budget for it. They approved his organization. Uh, five years later, uh, to this day, we have had 97 dogs come to our campus as a part of what's called Two-Step. It stands for Tulane University Service Training Dog Program. And I give you this example to show you that no matter how crazy your ideas might be at Tulane, we are a big enough school that we've got all kinds of resources, 300 student-led clubs and organizations, all kinds of ways you can get something done but we're small enough that it's actually gonna happen. And so I think um, when you think about size, Tulane really is the perfect kind of benefit of a big school and a small school combined into one. 
So the second thing you kind of want to think about when you're thinking about if a school is a good fit is the type of people that go to school there. And I think people are really important to kind of talk about who are you going to be interacting with. Some of my colleagues mentioned the benefits that you have of, of really having professors teach you. So these type of people that you will meet are a really important part of the college application and search process. And just briefly telling you about the people at Tulane, um, one of the things that I love about our university is that we are currently the most geographically diverse school in America, which means students actually travel further to go to Tulane than any other university in America. Our average freshman is 988 miles away from their hometown. And our top four most represented states in our class, number one is California, number two is Louisiana, number three is New York, and number four is Illinois. And that's like the four corners of America. And I think that's kind of cool because I love the sense that you're going to be in classes with people from all around the country and all different places and all around the world. And I think that's important because we learn the best when we learn from people who are different from us. And I loved coming to freshman year at Tulane my first class I took was my English 101 course, and there was 14 students in my class, and we were from 14 different states. And that's just the experience that you get as a student. All, all three of us represent schools that are out of the state of California. And I think we all agree that, you know, you have four years where you can take an adventure, try something different, you know, get out of the state for a little bit. You should definitely take advantage of that. And that's where you've got these really cool opportunities to just explore, find different places, meet different students, and really realize that you really will learn the best when you're out of your comfort zone a little bit, when you're learning from people who are different from you. So the last thing I want to tell you, and this slide's perfect to talk about it, is our location. And I think when you think about location, that's going to be a big, big uh, player in the whole where will you fit in the best. And I am biased, I apologize to my colleagues, but I think that we're located in the best college city in America. Uh, we're located right in the heart of New Orleans, Louisiana, and a couple of reasons why I think New Orleans is truly one of the most epic college cities in America. The first is the most obvious reason, and that's the social experience you will get here in New Orleans is second to none. We are a city that literally celebrates everything we possibly can. We have more festivals than we do days of the school year. Right before we shut down for COVID, the list of festivals just in the month of February was the Fried Chicken Festival, the Mac and Cheese Festival, the Po' Boy Festival, and when you're old enough, the Cheese and Wine Festival, which is obviously my personal favorite. Um, you will never be bored in this city. Um, we celebrate everything we possibly can. We have 88 parades that go just during Mardi Gras season alone, so there's never a dull moment. Second reason why New Orleans is a great college city is because the city becomes this college for you. And so, so, so much of what you learn as a student at Tulane, it doesn't take place on our campus, but it takes place in some of these pictures. So it takes place throughout the city of New Orleans. Specifically, I'm talking about things like research opportunities and internships. As far as research goes, I think New Orleans could be one of the most researchable cities in America because we're one of the oldest. Um, we are currently celebrating our 304th birthday here in New Orleans. So if you're watching this webinar and you're thinking about majoring in something like literature or language or architecture or music or history you're going to be studying in a city like new orleans uh, we have more buildings on the national historic registry list than any city in america we're the birthplace of jazz music or where people like tennessee williams and william faulkner and mark twain with their great works of art some of the oldest african-american neighborhoods anywhere in the world are right here in new orleans so so much of what you study takes place through our city uh, internships are big for us as well a couple of examples of internships. Internships are huge here in New Orleans. Uh, two of my students last semester spent their semester doing an internship with the National World War II Museum, which is right here in New Orleans. Uh, two of my students got to an internship with the New Orleans Saints. They were very lucky to do that. Uh, the film industry is quite big here in New Orleans. On campus alone, they filmed everything from Pitch Perfect to 22 Jump Street to American Horror Story. Uh, fun fact, all of the extras in the movie Pitch Perfect are real Tulane Acapella students. Another fun fact, the movie that won the best picture at the Oscars last year, The Green Book, was totally filmed on our campus. So our students doing film industry, want to be extras in movies, all kinds of ways the city become alive with opportunities to educate yourself on campus and off. The very last thing I want to tell you is I think the number one reason why New Orleans is the best college city in America. And it's the, kind of the reason why a lot of our students choose Tulane. Um, earlier I mentioned I graduated from Tulane with the class of 2005. What I didn't mention is I actually graduated uh, and the next day I got a call that I'd been hired as a brand new admission counselor working here at Tulane in the Office of Admission. And so a couple weeks after that, I started my first day of work at Tulane as a brand new admission counselor. Six weeks after that, Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New Orleans. And so my first job was working for a, a closed university in a totally uninhabitable city. And it's interesting because all these emotions we're going through right now with the anxiety and the uncertainty of the future, um, New Orleans has been there before. Uh, 15 years ago, you know, many people thought we would never recover. 
And so one of the most amazing things that happened to Tulane after that is that we became the first university in America to have a public service component of graduation. So what this means to this day is that every one of our students as a part of their junior and senior year will actually design and implement a full scale public service project uh, to take their major from the classroom and bring it somewhere into our community to make a difference in someone's life. Doesn't matter what you study, you take that major and you bring it into an internship, a research project, study abroad, and you make a direct impact into someone's community. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we have an amazing program here in architecture. And in our architecture stu school, our students can do what's called the urban build. Urban build is 15 students who are selected in the first semester of their junior year. And in the first semester, they actually design, each of them designs their own home that potentially could be built in New Orleans. So using green technology, very energy efficient, each student designs their own home. At the end of the first semester, all of those 16 students gather together for a review. They vote on their favorite home out of the 16. And then in the second semester, those same 16 students go into the city of New Orleans and they build that winning house. Now, I think this is cool for two reasons. One, what better way to learn about architecture than actually designing a home and then going out and building it and setting concrete blocks and putting in wood floors and watching something that you yourself have conceptualized come to fruition. But on the flip side, to be a 21 year old architecture student and hand a set of keys over to a family who has just purchased their first home at cost in a low income neighborhood, that's like a life changing experience for everyone involved. No matter what you study at Tulane, you will have that experience. Louisiana is home to a fifth of America's wetlands. So our students are doing research on wetland loss in our um, environmental studies programs. Um, Tulane has one of only 12 undergraduate programs in public health in the country. Now would be a really, 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 really good time to study public health. You know, it saves more lives in medicine. It studies how diseases kind of travel through a population of people. And our students are researching all around the world. How can we prevent these things from spreading? No matter what you study at Tulane, you will make a direct impact into your community. It's the main reason why for the last four years in a row, Tulane has been ranked number one on the Princeton Review's list for students most engaged in community service. So that's in large part why New Orleans is such a great place to go to school and why you can really make an impact in your community. I think I do just have one more slide that has some information about our deadlines. You can see them all there, almost very similar to my colleagues. Um, and you can visit our website to learn more. That's it. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much. Um, Jeff, Loretta, and Larissa, it's, thank you for, for coming on and spending time and giving us so much information about um, each one of your schools. And um, every time I, I do one of these or I do a college fair or I do any of those, I, I, it, I just want to go back to school. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to school and I want to study at each one of those locations. Um, and uh, so this is the, the launch of the College Talk series. And as um, Jeff mentioned, each school in each location is what we call fit. Um, in the college admissions world. And all of those things need to work for you in order for you to, um, you know, find that fit. Um, so the, uh, the idea with these college talks is that I'll be bringing um, three schools every, I, I think I have one scheduled for every Tuesday from different parts of the country. So um, we have the Pacific Northwest, West, um, Tulane, is that considered the South, Jeff? Are we technically South? So okay, South. Um, and then we have um, the Midwest in, in oh, um, yes, Midwest in Ohio. Um, so that is the, the hope, is that I'll get, give you the opportunity to explore schools from around the country. Um, I do have UCs on there also. Um, this Thursday, I'll be launching the College Admister Admissions Masterclass, which you'll get information about this afterwards with regards to um, being able to go through your college admissions process. It is a 12-month program where you'll be meeting with me once a month. Um, it is a, a more affordable way of doing independent um, consulting in comparison to one-on-one. -on -one, you'll be working um, in a group. So that is an option. These are um, the various things that you'll get in there. There'll be a live session. Um, you'll have um, access to those archives and um, you'll have uh, two different support groups depending on which one you wanna do, the Jumpstart or the All In package. Um, and all of those things with regards to college planning, um, finding that fit, affordability, um, 
you know, matching with regards to uh, your interests and, um, and then looking at our organization and checklist tools so that you don't miss any of those deadlines that Jeff, Loretta and Larissa talked about. Make sure that you are on track to get everything in there. And then um, that college fit survey is one of the last things. So I have that option as one of the ways to go. And then we have the full comprehensive packages, which allows you to apply to as many as 20 schools, which I don't recommend to anyone because that's too much. Um, but there are some people who um, want to do that um, and it'll include all of the various advising evaluating your transcripts you know um, going over essay brainstorming topics and um, all of these um, schools are on the common app so there'll be a personal statement that you need to do um, if you do a UC you'll have the personal insight questions so there, there is a writing component and these are all the things that you get in that comprehensive package, which is um, your um, interest profile assessment. We work on that academic resume. Um, we look at um, education and career path objectives with regards to fit as, you know, Jeff was discussing, you know, what is it that you're interested in doing? Where do you want to be? Um, you know, who should you get those letters of recommendation from? Um, again, brainstorming for those college essays with regards to topic. We do look at financial planning. Um, and then prep for those standardized tests, depending on whether or not that school is going to be test optional or not. And then looking at the various extracurricular and summer activities that will allow you to put together that entire um, application for the holistic review. So those are just some of the things that um, you will get information about. You'll also get a recording of this so that if you missed anything that Larissa, Loretta, or Jeff spoke about, you'll be able to go back and um, listen to it and um, all our contact information is on here. So now I encourage you to ask these wonderful experienced um, expertise um, in each one of their areas to um, any questions about their their school or um, any other school. I'm going to I'm going to post a question to all three of you um, if you don't mind um, just to start the the conversation. Um, with regards to what um, is what talk is going on on your campus with regards to um, opening campus students on campus what that looks like for the fall so whoever would like to go first yeah I'll go ahead and start just because I, I spoke first so again Larissa from Miami University in Ohio our plan for the fall right now is to open so we are moving forward as if we are going to be present in the fall and they have a task force that was put together pretty soon after the institution closed initially due to COVID-19 and they have been working on making contingency plans so the university while planning on opening is working on reducing class sizes even more um, and but also having more classes so that enough students can still get their credits and things they need so that is one thing we're working on we have already worked to increase um, staff that will be cleaning high touch areas we have discussed um, in our dining facilities potentially using compostable or recyclable materials as opposed to forks and plates and um, that get washed and reused i know that that's still there's some discussion on which one is going to be better so i'm uh, not sure about that but it's in discussion and they are also in our dining facilities as opposed to students serving themselves food and um, they will make sure that their employees serving food so that there's not cross contamination of utensils um, residence halls for space reasons we aren't able to give students individual rooms but we are giving more allowances for students who might want to live off campus typically our students are required to live on campus their first two years but for instance we're now um, potentially allowing students to live with a relative that's nearby as opposed to living on campus where traditionally we wouldn't have necessarily done that so we're trying to be accommodating and flexible um, but we'll see it's possible that the government will not permit us to be on campus and so they're also working on um, creating courses that can be in person or virtual so that the transition can be pretty um, easy this last semester all of our classes still happened live they were just logging on um, to a computer and watching as opposed to um, being there in person but for students who didn't have appropriate equipment we supplied um, portable Wi-Fi, laptops, um, and then up to $500 in Visa gift cards so students could get home and get supplies they needed to do classes um, virtually as opposed to being in person. So we 
have all of those supplies ready as well if we need them to continue to support our students. But hopefully we'll be in person and um, things might just look a little bit different. I've been getting the question on if we're going to be requiring masks for students. I don't know. I would say that it's definitely possible and um, at least um, starting out the semester that that would be something we would ask students to have on while they're in public spaces or class. But that's something our task force is working on. So. Um, We'll see. It'll be a little bit different and hopefully by the time students in fall 2021 are coming, we won't be worrying about all of this. But nonetheless, um, it's good to understand what universities are doing and how we're supporting our students. So that's what we're up to. I don't know if Loretta or Jeff want to jump in as well. Very similar to what Larissa said um, is happening also at the University of Oregon. So we are on track to start uh, in person in this fall in the fall. Uh, we're on the quarter system. So we start very late in September. So that gives us a lot of optimism that we will be able to have students move into the residential halls and things like that. Of course, we do have we have a full task force to take um, social distancing and other restrictions that could come and play with that in terms of space and housing, as well as um, decreasing class sizes uh, and different things along those lines. Um, but as you all know, this is a very fluid situation and it can change in a drop of the hat. So we're kind of preparing for any situation. But at this moment in time, we are on track to start in, in person in the fall. I get the pleasure of being on all of these task forces that my colleagues are mentioning. It's a wild ride. Um, echoing all that, the only thing that I'll say is we're doing it a little bit differently, kind of following the Notre Dame model. And that's actually our plan is to potentially open up a little early. So we're opening up probably for our students middle of August. And then the plan is to have our students stay all the way through on campus and through Thanksgiving and then go home at Thanksgiving, and that would be the end of the semester. The idea behind that is minimizing travel, minimizing people coming back and forth to campus, going back home, um, you know, potentially infecting older relatives. Uh, and so that's our hope that we'll be able to send our students home for Thanksgiving, and then they'll come back after New Year's for the start of the second semester. But my colleagues hinted at this. We, we're, at the, we're at the mercy of our state and local officials, so that's our plan right now. Um, I can tell you I was, I was supposed to get married last week and I'm now on the third iteration of the date for my wedding, a large part because we have to abide by city's policy. So we have these hopes and dreams, but nobody has an idea what really is going to happen. So just sure. hoping for the best. Thank you. Um, what does that, Jeff, I'm sorry, what does that look like with regards to, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought with um, opening up. Um, Okay, I don't remember what I was going to ask you. You were talking about it and oh, yeah. Thanksgiving with regards to Thanksgiving. Does that mean that they'll be taking their finals or will they be taking their finals remotely? Correct. Like so that everything means will be done by Thanksgiving. Right. That means they'll take their final exams remotely. Okay. So the entire semester will go from the middle of August. Um, and by the way, this is not official yet. So if anyone's watching this, this isn't. <laughs> just, this is just the chatter on our task force. And I actually have a, another meeting as soon as this. Uh, webinar is over with that task force, but the plan would be to have them stay all the way through Thanksgiving, go home for Thanksgiving, and then next week they take all their finals remotely. Okay. We have an, an, another element that kind of complicates things here in New Orleans and that, so we have to be cognizant of hurricane season and just building in time just in case we have to evacuate it all, so a lot to take in right now. All right. Well, I actually have a question for you, Jeff, in the Q&A. Um, the question was, Tulane, anything about tuition guarantee and or scholarship support? Yeah, Can sorry I didn't cover that. So um, I'm jealous of my colleagues. I would love to have tuition stay in, in place all, uh, all of the years. Uh, I represent the, I guess, the one private school on this webinar today. So that means we are unfortunately more expensive. Our overall cost of tuition fees, room and board transportation is in the low 70s. So somewhere in the low $70,000 per year. Good news is 80% of our students receive some form of scholarship, whether that be need-based aid or merit-based aid. Um, similar to my colleagues who'd mentioned, um, we don't have applications that are required for our merit scholarship. So every student who's admitted is automatically considered for our scholarship. Um, similar to, I believe, Oregon, we do have the STAMP scholarship, which is one of our full tuition awards. We also offer about, about 250 different full tuition awards every year. And then um, filling out the FAFSA and the CSS profile will consider you for need-based financial aid. So we continue to be one of the most generous private schools in the country, but do keep in mind that's going to be a big part of this process, thinking about financial fit as well. Okay. All right. So the next question I have here is, um, how will taking my classes pass fail affect my applications? I can just quickly say it won't at all. We, um, we are here to support you as much as we possibly can. Um, I don't want to speak for, for Oregon or, or Miami, but I will say that 
none of this is your fault. So we would never ding you if your pass fail. We're gonna give you the benefit of the doubt in every way we can. So I'll even train my staff to say, listen, if a student in their first semester of their junior year was starting to see a nice upward trend and then their second semester is all pass fail and it's passing, well, let's continue, let's just assume that upward trend is gonna continue. So we wanna make sure that any student watching this knows that we're gonna give you every benefit of the doubt that we can. We're gonna assume that this is a, a unique situation and uh, we'll, we'll just roll with the punches. Thank you. Yeah, and just to add on to that, the Common App has just announced that they will have a section that is a response to COVID-19 and how it affected you. So you will actually be able to tell colleges, and I would imagine those that have their own application will likely be adding something as well. You will be able to tell us exactly what happened. So you can say, my school went pass fail. I wasn't used to taking classes virtually. They only gave me two weeks to decide. So I took pass fail, but I actually got A's and B's in all my classes. Whatever it is, you're going to get to write that on your application. So it is not going to harm you in any way. And like I mentioned, we're working on what that looks like exactly for scholarships and things that used to have pretty standardized levels. It will likely be that we make those a little more fluid and we change our process a little bit, um, but it's not going to harm you. So don't feel like you shouldn't take pass fail if you think that's the best option for you. Um, we're gonna work around you, not your fault that we're in a global pandemic, not your fault that you're having to take classes from potentially your bedroom or kitchen or living room, um, and we will make sure that you still get the support you need. So um, definitely wanted to echo Jeff, but also let you know, you will be able to tell us exactly how COVID-19 affected you. I'm glad Larissa brought up that section of the Common App because um, we're, I'm really interested to see how students use it. My one piece of advice, I think Larissa is absolutely right, just explain the facts. So I use the, the piece of advice, explain but don't complain. Reason being, there is literally not a human being on the planet not going through this right now. And everyone responds differently and some folks' struggles are different from others. But you don't want to spend a lot of time complaining about it or saying you're, you know, how many challenges you face. Instead, just say, here are the facts. This was tough for me. This is what my school did and just keep it black and white as opposed to kind of making it too much of a complaining experience. Because again, it, uh, as tough as this is, it's tough for everyone. I echo everything that Jeff and Larissa just said. It is not gonna hurt you in regards to Oregon whatsoever. We are working with you. We're, we are your biggest advocates. We want to say yes to you in the admissions process. All right, so next question I have here, it's for all three. Um, do any of your schools expect to increase the off-campus or distance learning offerings and adjust tuition costs accordingly? Do you have any information on that? Question of the hour. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk a little bit and I will, I'll start with the tuition piece of this. Um, public institutions, their tuition is typically governed by part of the government. So we often are not able to just make changes to our tuition. Um, so from the tuition side, we do have certain degrees that are all online and they do have a different cost than in person. Um, so it is possible, I know that's something we're exploring. For students who are looking for kind of that quote traditional four year experience, um, I don't know. I know that our institution already has a winter term and summer terms, two summer terms, in which we offer an abundance of online learning opportunities and students can actually start those before they um, start their first semester in the fall. So a lot of our students are able to graduate in three years if they so choose by taking those summer and winter courses um, that are all online. So maybe we might be able to increase but i'm not sure long term um, what that's going to look like exactly i wish that um we'd be able to adjust tuition for sure and have an answer on that but unfortunately we're kind of at the mercy of um, outside forces on on the tuition piece at least for a public institution thank you Yes, uh, very similar with Oregon. Um, we are a state institution, so um, our funding um, is, you know, comes from the state as well as the federal government, and that often dictates dictates our tuition. So we can't make changes to tuition, and unfortunately, we're not able to do so um, because of COVID. But um, unlike maybe some of my colleagues here, Oregon really does not have um, any online classes or degree options online. So moving remote was definitely a learning process and adjustment for our faculty members as well as our students. Um, we're not we're not going to expand distant lear distance learning at this moment in time. I mean we'll definitely 
have to if we cannot have in um, in person classes, but we're not planning on offering degree options just based of the result of COVID at this moment in time. That could change, but right now we're hoping to operate as what is our normal. Jeff, ditto all that. Ah. <laughs> Okay, did all that. He let Larissa and Loretta do all the work. Um, all right, do I have any? I don't see any other questions. Oh, nope, I've got one more. Um, do any of you expect to lower enrollment over the next few years? No. No? Mm, no. N not significantly. Um, in full transparency, Miami last year had the largest class that we've ever had. So we were actually attempting to slightly decrease enrollment just because of beds on campus for our first and second year students that we require to live on campus. But um, the numbers that we have as of this moment are right on par to what we were expecting to get this year anyways. So we don't expect any significant alteration. What do your numbers look like? I know, Loretta, I know Oregon has extended their deadline. Larissa and Jeff, your deadline has been extended also for um, uh, decisions for this year. Based on those numbers, what do you think next year's 2021 class will look like if the yield for this year isn't what you expected it to be? Is it going to be more competitive with transfer applications, with deferments? How is that going to affect the junior class or what do you think? I'll take that one. So I'll, I'll, I'll first tell you that Tulane's, um, Tulane did not extend our May 1st deadline. We kept it at May 1st, but we were able to offer some flexibility for some students that needed some more time. But our freshman class came in exactly where we needed it to be, and we're kind of monitoring summer mount just to see how that's going to look. Um, I'm sure that my, my colleagues will agree we're getting a lot of questions about um, next year's class and about if a lot of students are taking gap years, how will that impact the junior class? What I can tell you is that um, in this world that we're living in, the, um, there are certain things that you can control. You can control like, you know, washing your hands and social distancing, but there are some things you can't control. And one of the things you can't control is how the numbers are gonna shake up at certain colleges. And so I get a lot of families that are really nervous about, is it gonna be harder to get in if more students are taking a gap year? The reality is, is it, it probably won't be. I mean, we usually have around 40 students take a gap year. Maybe we'll have 45 this year or 50. So it'll be a very small number. But that falls into the category of something that you cannot control at all. And so I always tell students, especially juniors, if there are some things you just can't control, can you kind of just let it go? Because you can't call the seniors and say, don't take a gap year. You can't call a school and say, what are your numbers looking like? How is yield going to impact me? Um, that definitely falls into the realm of something that you have no control over. So my suggestion with some of those situations is just don't worry about it. I mean, I know it's easier said than done, but there are certain things in this world you can control. And if you can't control it, you gotta let it be. And I think for juniors, there are some things you really can't control. Numbers, yield, gap years, that type of stuff. Honestly, don't worry about it. There's nothing you can do about it. So I would just suggest not worrying about it. Great. Totally agree. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. And, that, and that's what I've been talking about. Well. What was that? I said that advice goes for parents as well. Yes, yes, definitely for the parents and for the students. Um, I am giving the same advice to my students with um, you can't control it. So changing your, I have some students who are, are, are saying, well, then I'm just not going to apply to a four year and I'm going to start off at a community college and transfer because it's going to be too competitive to get in next year with all of the various changes that are happening with test optional, not test optional. And my answer is you've been on a trajectory and on a road for this long, just making a knee jerk reaction and changing that now based on something that we don't know or how we're going to, or what that's going to pan out to be is not the smartest decision to make. So um, thank you very much for supporting that and, um, and you know, giving that evidence from your side of the desk also. You know, keeping on track is what you should be doing right now, um, even with all of the changes. And um, you know, basically take the bull by the horns on the things that you can control. So um, I don't see any more questions here. Um, so I really, really can't thank you, all three of you enough, Jeff, Larissa, and Loretta. All our contact information is on the screen. Myself, Jeff, Loretta, and Larissa, our email addresses are there. If um, you need to reach out to any of us, we are more than happy to answer any of your questions. And um, um, thank you again. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you. you so much.
Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.